Canto 8 of the Purgatory is still set in this very beautiful valley with nature showing superlative colours and it's populated by the so-called rulers, um, those souls who are rather preoccupied with their lives on earth, struggling to work out their own salvation by turning inwards um, and leaving earth behind. Dante and Virgil have been led by Sordello, they're overlooking the top of the valley, and the canto opens with two similes. One, I think, looks backwards, and one looks forwards. And the one that looks backwards describes now being that time of day, remember that it's evening fast approaching now, um, that time of day where the sailor longs to be back in port, there's a nostalgic pull to return home. And then quickly following that is a second simile where Dante describes a pilgrim who towards the end of the day hears a bell tolling and longs to be in their next port of refuge. So you've got this sense of are you going to return home or are you going to step to the next place of resting along the way, along the way of the pilgrimage. And the two similes don't just evoke the end of the day, which we're at now in purgatory, but also evoke, I think, the court nature of, well, maybe it's Dante's soul, um, maybe the souls of those in this valley, you know, are they wanting to return to a rather comfortable version of life on earth in this valley? Or are they wanting to push on to continue the pilgrimage? And I think that the canto is also one of those ones which is very clearly given for us. I mean, they're all given for us, but this is one of the cantos where actually Dante addresses the reader, um, says, look through the veil, which is thinner now. Um, he's saying that the events which he's seen and is now describing for our benefit, their deeper meaning um, can become clearer to us now. He's asking us to take the step forward on the pilgrimage rather than wanting to return home. So it's a very interesting transitional dialogue. It's also a transitional dialogue, uh, sorry, a transitional canto, because um, this is the eighth canto of the purgatory. And um, as is sometimes noted, um, it parallels the ninth canto of the Inferno. Now, the ninth canto of the Inferno is sometimes said actually to be the eighth canto because the first canto of the Inferno is the kind of introductory canto. So we're kind of eight cantos into the action of the Purgatory, and you might expect that to mirror the action of the eight cantos into the Inferno. This is sometimes known as the hierarchical reading of the Divine Comedy. And sure enough, if you remember the ninth stroke eighth canto of the Inferno. Um, this is the one before the walls of Dis, where the angel appears. And similarly in this canto too, two angels are going to appear. And it makes you wonder, what prison are these souls in now? Because clearly they're not manning the battlements of the infernal city of Dis, um, which we learn was actually the fortification designed to keep God out rather than to imprison them in, although it seemed like a kind of prison gate. What is going on here now in purgatory with these souls in this valley? And to cut to the chase, I think what we see with the benefit of our eyes reading and contemplating, steered by Dante the poet, as much as what's actually happened to Dante the pilgrim, we realise now that these souls are imprisoned, are self-imprisoned, partly by their preoccupation with life on earth, which they're really struggling to leave behind. But to this, in this canto, is now added the further element of the liturgical life of the church. It's the end of the day. We've heard the Salve Regina being sung. We're going to hear the um, Te Lucis Ante sung as well, which is the Compline canticle before the ending of the day. And the sense which had already been, I think, evoked in the previous canto is deepened now, that the liturgical rounds, the rounds of the day and the night, with its own beauty and its own intense allure, can itself become a trap, can keep you from moving forward in the pilgrimage, because 
not because you're frightened, as the souls were in this, but because you're in love with the beauty of earthly liturgy, and that keeps you from moving on. It's the danger, if you like, of those who feel that, well, on the one hand, just doing what the church prescribes is enough to achieve salvation. And the reason that isn't enough, I think, is being intimated is because, like the rulers, you have to really take that in and work on your own salvation, work out what it means for the, um, the particularities of your own soul, your own life, your own ups and downs, your own faults and failings. Unless you make it real for yourself, um, it's not going to work. It's a bit like the times that Dante and Virgil turned left, sorry, turned right rather than left in the Inferno. They had to sort of make their own mistakes. They had to go their own way to some degree to make God's way their own. And if just doing what the church prescribes isn't going to really be enough to move you to new places, spiritually speaking, so too a church that becomes too preoccupied with its secular tasks gets stuck too. Um, you know, think of the valley. It's rather beautiful, like the inside, you might say, of a gorgeously decorated medieval cathedral and with its sparkling marble and jewels and precious stones and, and polished surfaces. Um, it's full of the rulers, it's full of the great and the good, saying their prayers, being faithful and trying to live, you know, good lives, um, even if actually in reality they were rather tyrannical and not quite up to the task. Um, it feels a bit like the church on earth. Um, but, you know, as Augustine had said, the church on earth must remember it's the pilgrim church. It must move forwards and not get stuck with purely secular concerns. Um, that was clearly a danger in Dante's time um, with the wars that so shaped his life and the involvement of the Pope and so on. And I think it's equally a danger now where it's very easy for particularly established churches, churches very involved with the politics, the building up of civic society, um, to feel that that's their main task, that's where their energy is really drawn. Um, they forget that actually they're a means to another end. Um, it's doubly so difficult now in purgatory because good things are being done, but they're limited things, and even the good can trap you from what is best if you're not prepared to give the good up. Dante the Pilgrim seems at this point to himself be moving on, in fact, to be more drawn to the Pilgrim's call because it said that he stops listening to the words of all the great and the good describing their lives, which had filled the last canto, and instead he turns from hearing to seeing. Um, he looks up um, and he sees two things when he looks up. Um, first of all, he sees one pilgrim singing the Te Lucis Ante, this, pil this canticle before the ending of the day, um, and its beauty really, really moves him. Um, it, you know, he sees, in a way, what's going on here and now. Um, the words were drawing him to the past. Sight brings him into the present um, with the sight of this devout um, pilgrim, sorry, this devout soul. Um, and I mean, that's good. It's good to be drawn into the present. But of course, you also have to discern the present. Um, and that is the deeper question which we as readers are left with. You know, now that we see these souls doing this apparently good thing of singing the Compline hymn at the end of the day, um, of looking forward to divine salvation, of seeking the deadly foe, as the Tilucius Ante talks about, being defeated. These seem like good things, but can we discern whether something nonetheless is a bit amiss? Sordello then tells Dante that something apparently quite surprising is going to happen, although right from the get-go, Sordello doesn't seem that bothered by it though Dante the Pilgrim really is, because Sordello tells Dante that it's soon going to be the time when two angels will descend from heaven to fight off a serpent. Now Dante is chilled by this. Um, in fact, Dante the poet uses the word chilled, which Dante the Pilgrim had felt when he saw Lucifer. Um, so Dante really sits up at this, um, but it happens every day kind of like clockwork, two angels appear, 
a serpent appears, the angel sees off the serpent. And it's very striking that no one else in the valley is that bothered. Some don't even look and no one really raises an eyebrow. An eyebrow. There's a sense, I think, that you know, the angels are sort of performing this ritual in rather an empty way. Um, some people who see angels, um, I think there are some who really do and um, do so with some discernment and they're for me with some authenticity. Um, one of the things that's striking that they say actually is that angels are very inclined to do what humans ask of them, um, but we're asked to collaborate with them. And if we ask them to do rather humdrum, um, repetitive things, you know, they will do that, um, although they long to do more inspiring things. And that came back to my mind when I was reading this canto because it seems here that um, the souls in the valley by performing their liturgy, asking for defence against the knightly foe. Um, they do indeed call down the angels um, and achieve that, um, but it just repeats. It's, it's not a very spiritually significant moment. Um, it's not leading anywhere else. Um, it's a kind of drama, but it's a rather empty performance of a drama, rather than really um, enlivening the souls, um, taking them somewhere, opening up their sight, um, Though Dante, the pilgrim, engaged with this round for the first time in purgatory, is rather alert and frightened and wondering quite what's going to happen. Before this empty drama unfolds, um, they descend into the valley and they meet Nino. Um, he was the grandson of Ugolino, um, who we met in the darkest moments of the Inferno. Um, and it seems that Dante and Nino knew each other in life. Um, Nino was certainly a leader involved in the war between the Guelphs and the Ghibellines. It's a very friendly encounter and actually begins with Dante explaining to Nino and to Sordello, because he hasn't actually told him this yet, um, that he's still alive. And both Nino and Sordello are amazed at this. Uh, what divine grace might bring this about, they say. And very interestingly, they said that they couldn't believe what Dante was telling them. Again, I think this is a reflection of them not having the spiritual sight awakened enough to see new things. And they're very preoccupied with what they think they know already. Um, Nino then describes his life um, rather bitterly, um, but I think that we're readers are supposed to see through the thinner veil and understand it allegorically. Um, what Nino describes is how, um, well, what he asks Dante to do actually is to remember him to his daughter, um, and interestingly, not his wife. And he tells us why not his wife, um, because um, after his death, um, his wife, rather quickly, Nino felt, moved on and married again. And I think that we're supposed to understand this um, as a bit of an allegory for um, the church. Um, remember that in the medieval mind, the church was seen as the bride um, of Christ, Christ seen as the bridegroom. It's very interesting that Nino's wife's actually called Beatrice. Um, and of course, whenever the name Beatrice comes up in the Divine Comedy, um, when it's not Beatrice, you wonder, are we being told about another side of the love that can move you towards the divine? And so I think Nino's wife here stands for a love that failed to move you towards the divine. Um, and what Nino says of his wife is that um, as soon as he disappeared, as soon as he um, stepped from her sight, um, she needed to marry again in order to feel and touch um, love, uh, a new husband. Uh, now Nino is very bitter about this, um, and if you'll forgive the slightly uh, sort of gendered analogy, um, I think what this is supposed to be saying is that the church too needs to stay in touch and in sight of what it knows and loves, its embodied practices if you like, um, and it finds it very hard when it can't do the everyday round, and when it can't perform its liturgical tasks, when it can't enter the music and the buildings, um, its embodied life, which are very beautiful, um, but are the means to an end. So I think that's why the story of Nino and Beatrice appears here. It's not just the details of a soul, but 
with our eyes as readers. It's communicating another aspect of this idea that we've got to move on beyond earthly Christian life um, if we are to um, follow the pilgrimage the next step of the way. It's interesting that Dante the Pilgrim finds it hard to focus on Nino's story. Um, he, at this moment at least, is looking further on. And in fact, he looks up at the sky, um, always a good indicator in the Divine Comedy. Um, and he sees now three stars in the sky in the evening. Remember, at the dawn of the morning, he'd seen the four stars of the Southern Cross. Um, he sees three stars now. Um, they're the three stars that um, brighten um, the southern hemisphere skies um, on the other side of the day um, when the four stars have set. So there's an astronomical reality about this. Um, but most commentators agree that Dante sees in the three stars the three theological virtues, as they're called, faith, hope and love. Remember, he'd seen the four cardinal virtues before. And that makes sense to me because, you know, Dante the Pilgrim in this canto is indeed seeing with the eyes of faith, hope and love. Um, he's seeing more. Um, he's not just trapped in what's familiar and known. And so why wouldn't he, as it were, look up at the stars and see faith, um, uh, um, faith hope and love, as it were, shining down on him, drawing him forward, um, enlightening his soul? And then we move back to the drama of the angels and the serpent. Um, this interweaving in this canto, I think, is this push and this pull. What are we looking at? Where are we stepping towards? Are we stepping back? Um, the angels have descended. They're sat on either side of the valley. Um, very beautifully, it says they're holding the souls um, in their position. Um, they've got broken swords. Um, I think this is signaling to us that there's something a bit unnecessary, unreal about this enactment, but nonetheless they're doing it because the souls implicitly request it in their, um, their hymn. Um, and now what happens is that the serpent appears. Um, he's called a vicious streak. He appears crawling through the grass, but he's strangely nonchalant too. It's said that he stops and he kind of licks his back um, as if preoccupied with himself and more concerned with his own sort of well-being than what you normally think of the serpent being concerned with, um, which is um, leading human souls astray. Um, this serpent is strangely undastardly. And sure enough, what happens is that the angels swoop down, you know, rather beautifully, rather elegantly in their graceful motion. Um, the serpent immediately sees them and scuttles off again. And the serpents, the, the angels return to um, their original positions. Um, you know, Dante's been watching it all, um, finding it absolutely fascinating and slightly disturbing. Um, no one else seems to have batted an eyelid. Indeed, it's not mentioned again. What actually happens is a new soul speaks to Dante. He hadn't been looking at all. Um, he's Corrado Melaspina, and turns out he's going to be quite important for the rest of Dante's life on earth. Um, he was a ruler and his land offered refuge for Dante in the last part of his life um, as his exile from Florence continued. Um, that's prophesied here and in fact Dante praises Corrado for the virtue um, that his kingdom is known for. But it's as if Dante has got dragged back to his earthly concerns. Um, he too has rather lost sight of what he just saw. Um, it's almost as if he hasn't got the spiritual faculties to really engage with this. Um, you know, he knew to look. Um, he looked up at the heavens, he looked up at the stars, and he wasn't just listening to the preoccupations of the souls around him. And yet it's rather um, flittingly passed him by as well. And so the canto ends with us wondering just what it's going to take to really launch Dante on this journey up Mount Purgatory. Remember, we're still in the anti-purgatory. Um, we've been encountering various kinds of preoccupation, various kinds of difficulty with fully engaging on the task for which these souls are, in principle, saved. And we wonder what is going to happen now next for Dante the Pilgrim. And it's going to be quite dramatic.